Good evening and welcome back to the MMA Mad Podcast. The date is Monday, February 9th, and I'm joined as always by my co-host from the UK, Mr. Jim Carroll. Say hi to the listeners, Jim. How's it going, everyone? Welcome back. Sorry we've been away for a while, but we're back now. Uh, back with the guests as well, so that's good. And uh, hi from me as well. My name is Nick Risner, and this is the, I think it's the 11th episode of the podcast. I have to check on that, but uh, we have uh, UFC Fight Night 60 coming up, coming up on Saturday. Uh, we'll dive into that a little bit later, as well as the Anderson Silva and Nick Diaz fight from a week ago. And, of course, the ensuing drug test failures. Obviously, bad news for UFC fans, but uh, we'll talk about that. Anyway, before all that, we are joined today by a very special guest, a, uh, a member of SPG Ireland. He was a competitor on the 19th season of The Ultimate Fighter, the former Cage Warriors middleweight champion, and current Bama middleweight, Chris the Killing Fields. Thanks for joining us, Chris. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. No problem, Chris. Now, let's dive straight into your upcoming fight, Chris. You're fighting at Bama 18 in uh, lovely, uh, rainy Wolverhampton in England uh, in a couple of weekends' time. Um, now, what? first of all, I was wondering if you could tell us about you, the, uh, you, know, you signing with Bama. You was with Cage Warriors before. I know you had a fight outside of Cage Warriors, but what was the deal with... Because back in, in the UK, it seems to be Bama and Cage Warriors as the two main uh main you know organizations um so i was wondering what what made you go with bama rather than re-signing with cage warriors um basically like bama bama basically were telling me they want to make some moves this year and they just offered me a, a busy contract that's all i was looking for i wanted to fight a lot you know and uh they they gave me that opportunity they offered me uh five fights in 12 months so I, I want to be that busy, you know what I mean? That that's what I wanted. So um, so I was happy to sign with them. They're they're looking to make some moves, and yeah, I kind of want to be part of that. I'd kind of like I'd be my cage warriors for a long time, and they were great, and they did a lot a lot of good by me. But it, I kind of fancy the change, you know. So yeah. Well, so you this is a five fight deal. You're planning on fighting for all those five fights. This this isn't a one fight thing for you. Sort of a coming out of the tough house. This isn't a have a have one one fight get noticed and get back into the ufc this is you want to stay active have all them five fights yeah you know i had a lot of time off after tough i had some injuries and stuff and i kind of i've been on the shelf now for uh, like it, it, if you don't count tough it's almost a year and a half since i fought and uh i've had a lot of time to think about what i want from this sport and i think i got hung up on those three letters those three ufc letters and uh kind of took my eye off why I really started doing this and it's because I love fighting so um so like I just want to fight as regularly whatever happens if, like if if the UFC come along then while that's going on great and I get an opportunity to go with them that's perfect if not sure I'm happy to keep doing what I'm doing I, I figure the last while I just kind of I'm doing it for pure reasons I'm doing it I want to fight yeah we, we lost you a bit there you, you still there Chris yeah yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, hang on a sec. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, I can hear you better now. Yeah, that was fine. You just cut out for a minute. Um, yeah, you said it has been. It was June 2013, your last fight. Um, you said you've had a few. Yeah. Has there been a serious injury? Has there been anything that's kept you on the sidelines for a long while, or? Uh, it, it just kind of like um, I, I've, I've had a few back injuries through my career, and that kind of flared up again. And it, see, we were on the shelf with tough. Uh, for I think it was like six months, seven months, even more like, and um, and then it it just coincided with when that was finished that I got injured. So then it, it's almost a year before I'm right again. You know, kind of way. And then I was trying to figure out where I was going to fight, who was going to fight. A couple of fights fell through, and then Bama came through with a great offer. And kind of like I explained to them that I want to be busy. They said they'd love that. So here we are. So yeah. I actually wanted to talk to you a little bit about the. Uh time on Ultimate Fighter, just basically what was your general take on the experience overall? What were the, the uh, pros and cons of, of being on a show like that? Oof. Uh, pros, I'll find it hard to pick any. I hated it, basically, is the <laughs> simplest way to say it. I, I hated every minute of it. It was probably one of the most miserable experiences of my life. Without sounding like a little uh, 
moany bitch, you know. I know a lot of people spend uh, like are working really hard and they want the, like they love that opportunity. And I was I was quick to take it when it was offered to me, but uh, it's just not me, dude. That whole thing is just not me. Like it's not, yeah, it's it's, it's not my scene at all. So do you think it was uh, just you know your personality type and the type of uh, fighter that you are? Do you think that was the uh, the main issue with it, or do you think that you know after twenty seasons, do you think that the show simply run its course? Um. I think a little from column A, a little from column B, you know, for me, it just, like, I, I like being home, you know, I, I don't mind traveling to fight, but I like being home from a training camp and stuff, and I kind of find, um, I kind of, I think, like, you know, it used to be about taking guys that couldn't, uh, like, train full time and bringing them uh, somewhere where they could concentrate, I have that, I've one of the best facilities in the world, and I've, and I've some of the best coaches and best training partners, and then what it is now is take guys out of their comfort zone and hope they crack. You know what I mean? We the, like there's no need to bring people for six weeks anywhere. It's just it, it doesn't really make any. So like I was brought away from everything I'm comfortable with. Like put put in the house with a bunch of guys that I didn't really know and like different. Like I know America and Ireland isn't light years apart, but it's it's a pretty different culture, you know, and different mentality and stuff. So um, yeah, it was, it was a bit of a strange one for me, dude. And then, and then there's a lot of people who are playing the game. They're like they're on the show, like. You know, they they're looking for camera time and stuff. It's a bit, it's a bit weird. Yeah, it's interesting because that that actually uh, brings me to my next point too. I was just uh, it seems like the the argument for keeping the show around is to go to these uh, kind of random places. You know, they have top China and uh, and top Mexico, and not that there's not top camps in these places, but uh, it is a little bit harder to find top level training at, at uh, for people who are from these places. So it seems like now the value is to go to these places where it's basically serving the same purpose as the original seasons are tough, but you're right, when you're coming from a, a training camp where you already have all these top level partners, it's almost, not to say a downgrade, but it's either a downgrade or, or at the very least a lateral move for someone like you. So It's it, it's a downgrade as well, just it, not, not a knock on any of the guys I was training with. There was some, like, for me, some some of the best fighters in the house did, didn't perform there. They were like, uh, Tim, Tim, was, uh, Tim Williams was great, Anton was brilliant, and just they just didn't perform under in that situation like and i felt similar myself you know and i think even even like guys that, that did get an opportunity didn't perform like i feel like Carl didn't perform in the show but he did enough to get you know but it was just a hard environment to perform like it's just a really hard environment which does which sounds counterproductive what they should want is the best environment for you to perform you know because it's all about the fights at the end of the day yeah sure so go, going in do they take they take your mobiles off you? They take any form of communication back with your family off you, and you you just it's just about that show for the whole six weeks. Dude, I couldn't even bring a book. No. Couldn't listen to music. I couldn't like I couldn't play crosswords. Like, there was nothing. Like literally, there like the whole intention for well, like this might not be the intention. This it mightn't be as cynical as I'm saying, but for me, it felt like they were just trying to make me crack. And then I just happened to be the last fight of the quarterfinals, so I was fighting the week we were going home. So I was already done. I didn't want to be there anymore. You know what I mean? I was I I I clocked out already. And so and is the house is the, is the house cameraed up, or is there actual cameramen like following you around when you're trying to chill out? Like, is it that in your face? But all times. At all times. The, the guys were cool. To be fair to them, the, the cameramen were all cool, and the people working there were all cool. But you know they have a job to do and. They're, they're doing their job as much as we're trying to do ours but uh, yeah they're, they're there all the time and if like if, if something gets loud within two seconds they're in the room you know Yeah. I, sure. I got in a lot of trouble because I kept singing songs so anytime there was something going on that they're trying to film I'd, I'd keep singing songs because uh, you know, they obviously don't have the rights to the songs so they couldn't <laughs> put that stuff in so they did, did stuff <laughs> <laughs> what what was you singing? What what's your what's your fa what's your favorite song, Chris? To I, sing? I, I was singing. I was singing lots of Red Hot Chili Peppers stuff just to piss everyone off. I was just kind of entertaining myself at this stage. <laughs> <laughs> how, how about but, uh, how about the weight? Uh, obviously, you said you fought you fought with two weeks to go. Uh, how how was it keeping your weight as close to one eighty five? Uh, you know, as it is when you. I, I fought at two oh five on the show. Oh, oh, sure. Which was another mistake I made, and um, I fought. I actually fought like we were going home, saying we, the show was finished on a Saturday. I fought on a Wednesday before we went home, so I was literally like clocked out at that stage. Yeah, so the, the season was uh, half middleweights, half light heavyweights, right? Yeah, 
So what, what was your reasoning for going for 205? Was there uh, was that what the opportunity was, or did you think that you had a better chance there, or what? Uh, yeah, a couple of things. One, um, like uh, I'm, a, I'm a pretty big 185er, so I didn't fancy trying to do that cut all the time. And two, uh, Carl was coming as well. We're training partners and stuff, so we like we kind of agreed that he'd go 185, I'd go 205. I got you. And you mentioned Carl. Carl uh, Pendridge, 3-0 in the UFC now. Uh, Hulahans, 2-1. Ashling Daly, 1-0. Gunnar Nelson four and one, so obviously uh, SPG Island's kind of taken the UFC by storm. Uh, you guys have been expanding as well. You you uh, recently moved to a new gym. Uh, is there any sort of downside to that sort of growth and success? Uh, you know, have you lost some of the the small time gym? Is there more distractions, uh, stuff like that, with uh, all this uh, this boom that you guys have been experiencing lately? Yeah, no, no, I haven't really felt any of that. You know, um, like there's, it's kind of weird. There's, there's, there's more, he- there's more faces in the gym now, and probably more people that I don't know that well. If you get me, kind of like, they, they might be training for like, um, a few months or something in the gym, and I, I wouldn't know them that well. Just kind of say hello to. Whereas maybe when I started training there, it was kind of a much smaller group. Like, but that's, that's natural. That's, that's capitalism right there. <laughs> Things got to grow. Like, and. Uh, John's done a great job, and he kind of uh, I coach in the gym as well, so I'd know a lot more of the guys than uh, most of the guys off the fight team would, you know. Um, but like I'd say, John maybe has like four hundred members at the moment. Wow, four hundred members that big. So how's it? And how's there, sorry, Chris, carry on. Uh, no, just that they're the, these aren't guys doing fitness classes. These are guys doing uh, like either striking BJJ or all MMA basically. So. So how's it? How's it working in terms of? The, the names at the gym training. I, I saw a video uh, that um, our friends over at Severe MMA put on their page of uh, Conor McGregor being interviewed, uh, presumably after while he was finishing his training session, and it seemed like he was training very late at night at the gym. For example, yeah, I think he was locking up. Are you finding yeah. that the, the big names like yourself and Paddy and Conor, you're having to train separately at these strange times to avoid maybe uh, maybe being on the class with people that aren't aren't there for the right reasons or are there just to be training with you guys well see the the all the classes are kind of broke up into uh like kind of beginner intermediate and advanced and then also like the 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 pro and may fighters train during the day for sparring and stuff like that and uh we do technical sessions but they're usually at like times like say five or six so then it kind of cut before everyone comes in after work. But everyone's really cool, man. You know, no no one's kind of really hassling anyone or anything like that. It's there's a bit of a family buzz about the place. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. everyone's happy to be there. Like it's not um, it's not a, a like people coming up and hassling you all the time. It doesn't seem to be that mentality. It's kind of people are very supportive, and if they if they're taking a photo, they're taking a photo. But that stuff hasn't doesn't even really happen much. You know, guys yeah. are just happy to be there, and and it's kind of good for like guys to train with with guys that are of a higher level a little bit now and again, you know, it kind of, like, there's no assholes in our gym, basically is the easiest way to put it, so we're not going in to smash these guys, we're going in probably, like, moving around with them and maybe give them a couple of tips when we're done. Now, as far as how uh, SPG Ireland's perceived by uh, other people from other camps and, and you know, around these different promotions, uh, do you get the sense that you guys have a target on your back now, now that you've kind of become more of a, a household name in MMA, or uh, have you not really noticed any sort of change like that? No, see, it's it's kind of uh, happened quite organically because, uh, like, we like a few years ago, um, we were the biggest team in Ireland, so we would have had like we would have been on the biggest shows in Ireland and the UK at the time, which would have been cage contender, and then uh, like that would have been myself, Cahill, Connor, um, you know, and all like Ash and all the guys, and then we would have went to Cage Warriors together, and the same thing happened there, and then. It's crazy to even say out loud, but now it's happening in the UFC, you know, so it, it hasn't really kind of, we just kind of take it in our stride at this stage. But like, there was a, there's a little group of us that have been together from the start, and we kind of knew this is what was going to happen, you know, in our kind of way. We knew it, like, it still is surreal to see it now. It's surreal to know that my teammate's going to be fighting for a uh, UFC title soon. That's crazy. Like, we were, we were a bunch of guys training in a, t- in a small facility, like, just... Like you know, when like we're all learning on the job, as was our coach John. You know, and now we're now look, one of us is going to be going fighting for the the most prestigious title in in MMA. How how many pro fighters has the gym got now? Um, pros. We must have about like fourteen or something, fourteen or fifteen pros. But we've loads of amateurs that train as well, like with the pro team. 
Yes. So they train like full. They train full time. And he's John. He's John Corner in, you know, almost every weekend with that amount of amateurs and you know professionals. Yeah, and he leans on guys like me and stuff as well, and we do a bit for him. Uh, like I, I do a lot of coaching and cornering and stuff like that as well. I, I quite, I kind of see that as where I'm going to end up when I'm done fighting. You know, and I'm well, no, I, I know I'm definitely going to be a coach when I'm done fighting, but I kind of want to be done fighting before that. You know, and yeah. so there's a bunch of he leans on the the pros that have been fighting for a while to kind of go and corner guys uh, if he can make it or if he's at another show or something like that. Have you got a time scale in mind to how long you'd like to keep going? I mean, are you 31 now, is that correct? I'm 31, yeah. Uh, I, I don't really plan on fighting after 35, like uh, 35, 36. Uh, and it wouldn't bother me where I was in my career at that stage. If I was in the UFC, I'm just watching uh, the Notorious documentary, the the one that's on in Ireland every week at the moment. And it's the Poirier one. So Poirier's just walking out to fight and someone just threw an Ireland flag at him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can, I'm a bit frustrated. We can't get that in the UK yet. Um, uh, I, there's an RT player you can watch it on. Yeah, but it won't play. It says I'm, I'm not in the right region. Ah, oh, Dan, can you not get like uh, what's that thing called so you can pretend you're in Ireland? Yeah, like you know, a the way proxy. You can do it from? Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. I th- yeah, I think I'm gonna have to get. I'm gonna have to look at it. I, I, it looked a bit technical for me, but I'll uh, I'll have a look at it. Definitely. Check out Severe MMA as well. Severe Severe MMA. I'm sorry if that's bad for me to say it on your thing, but they tend that's to that. show the stuff. No, the no, 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 they're our uh, friends. They, they did record. Sean Sheehan recommended the proxy thing to me, and uh, I couldn't. I couldn't. I, I looked at it, and then it just looked too complicated. But I think I'll have to have a look again. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not great with the old technology, to be honest. <laughs> like, I just, I, I'm just sitting here watching my big 50-inch TV. I don't deal in all that uh, computer stuff. Like, it's not my thing. Sky, the sky is where it's at for me. But. Yeah, because I've seen, I've seen a brief clip of that documentary, the one where uh, Conor McGregor and he's flashing his Rolex with John Jones. I mean, that, yeah, must, yeah, yeah, yeah. that must be. I mean, I don't know much personally about Conor's upbringing. But I, I, I'm not sure he came from an overly wealthy family. So to see him, you know, running around with twenty-five thousand pound Rolex on his on his wrist, it must be pretty surreal as well. Yeah, man. But like you know, as I was saying, uh, like we've we've all been training together for a long time. So uh, I, I know he's earned it. I know he's been in the gym working his ass off. You know, kind of way. Um, but uh, he's he's a different man than me. If I had his money, I wouldn't be going around with Rolexes and all that <laughs> shit on. But that's honor, man. He, as as he says, he spends it and earns it, like, yeah. and it works for him. You know? Did did he buy his Range Rover yet? I don't, dude, I I I'd be I think Connor would be hard pushed to buy anything anymore. He just gets given shit. <laughs> right? Yeah, they say that as that, you get that, as you get. That's how you know you're famous. My bro gas hasn't been got nothing, but Connor gets given shit. Like Annie has money in the bank, you know. <laughs> yeah. So um, now you mentioned uh, that the notorious documentary is on in Ireland. You said every week, but uh, is it is it is he become has he become that big of a star in Ireland? Now, where, like, Again? It's actually it's on right now. I'm I'm watching it like as it's on TV right now on on a national channel. Is it uh, is it just like the end the endless uh, Conor McGregor show in Ireland? Has he become one of the biggest uh, celebrities in your country? Because even over here, at least uh, leading up to that Boston fight um, on Fox Sports One, first of all they're promoting it in all the big uh, network channels during the the NFL games. But then on Fox Sports One, I think like every day there was two different specials on on Conor McGregor. They were all. Uh, they were, they were all different specials. They weren't even repeats. It was just every day there's probably like, there must have been set, six or seven different specials that one week. And, uh, you know, you don't see that kind of uh, push from the UFC's promotion team, not even for John Jones or, or uh, GSP back then. They're really throwing their weight behind Conor McGregor. So uh, how, yeah, how crazy I, has I, it been on Irish television? It, it, like, it's, it's, it's pretty crazy. Like, um, like Con- Conor is one of the biggest celebrities now in, in the country. Like, like he's, he, he's right up there. Like, he... Uh, I, I remember hearing a story, and Conor never told me this story. I've never even asked him actually about it. But uh, a friend of mine, a friend of a friend, basically, this is how it went. My friend told me the story, but it was his friend that it had happened to. Uh, was just driving down the road one day, and there was a mob of people. And next thing, someone comes kind of jogging out of the mob, jumps in his car, and asks him to drive him around the corner. And it's Conor because he's getting mobbed by loads of people. Now, he didn't know that this is my friend's friend. So. The story got passed to me. I don't know if there's any truth in it or what the story is, but I'll have to check it with Connor. But that—that's how crazy it is. I'd say Connor struggles to walk down the street anymore. Yeah, he—he's big. He's big everywhere. 
I, I was in Thailand a few weeks back and uh, I went to watch Connor's fight against uh, Siva and, and the bar was full of Conor McGregor fans and this is this is uh, 6,000, 7,000 miles away. Yeah, yeah, I, he, you know, he, he kind of grabs people eh? and like, like you know, I, I know like because I, I read stuff, some people like him, some people don't like him, but they tune in to watch him. You know what I mean? They always tune in to watch him. Um, he's a he, he's an entertaining guy, and like I've heard comparisons to Muhammad Ali. I'm a big Muhammad Ali fan, so I find that mental. But uh, <laughs> but at the same side, he has that thing that when Ali was around, people wanted to watch him. You know, and that's that's the that's it. if you're a fighter, that's the main thing. You got to get people to want to watch you fight. Bro. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, let's get back onto onto Bama and, and your opponent, um, Chet Cone. Is that the correct pronunciation? I believe it is. I think like Coney, like uh, oh, Coney. I mean, Coney 2012. I don't know. It could be Coney. <laughs> yeah. Was it Fine Coney? Was that the uh, yeah? Yeah. Chet Coney. Um, he's making his Bama debut, uh, but he's on, he's on a yeah. five fight winning streak. Have you watched much tape on him? Do you know much on him? Yeah, I always do. I always watch a, a fair bit of tape on my opponents. Not nothing too crazy. They don't get lost in what they do, but I, I like to watch and see what way they move or what they do. Um. He's a good striker. He seems. It seems like he's he's good in his feet and he's aggressive and stuff. But uh, I've seen a lot of holes in his game. Yeah, sure. He's got a few. He's got a few losses by submission. Do you think? Do you think searching for the win on the grounds the way forward in the fight or? Do you, yeah, do you follow I, that I, SPG you probably fight though. You know, I'm I'm sure you've seen me fight that. Like, yeah, I could say that, and then I'll walk out and he'll throw one leg kick, and I'll go, all right, we're doing leg kicks, and then we'll be. <laughs> <laughs> kicking each other all over the place but uh yeah he, he does seem a little bit open on the ground but uh, you know what I'll, I'll just just go out and fight and the fight will go where it goes and I'm, uh, like i'm just things things are different for me now I'm, I'm doing this sport for pure reasons and i really enjoy training again which had kind of gone for me for a long time i was just kind of going through the motions and um i uh yeah, like I feel like my game has just come on so much, and and I know everyone says this bullshit, but I'm actually being like, this is actually what's going on, this, and this is what my coaches are telling me, and so like, my game has really taken a, a few leaps, and it's, I think I'm probably like, and I'm sure everyone does it at different ages, but I'm, I'm I'm maturing as a as a person and as a fighter in the last year a lot, so um, I'm I'm looking forward to going out and showing a new version of me off. Would you say you're in your prime? <laughs> I think this for my weight division now. I think I'm probably in my prime for the next two or three years, and that seems when I when I look at it like that's when guys seem to do their best in the heavier weight. Seems to be in their like uh, early to mid thirties, and then you know it's a steep drop after that. But I don't plan on being around. Sure. Yeah. I mean, what is the uh, what what is the, if you don't mind me asking, what is the deal with Bama? Can you fight elsewhere? I know they're saying that you they're signing up to fight fight deal. Can you fight elsewhere as well, or is it exclusivity to Bama? Uh, they they gave me a Zuffa clause in my contract, so I can fight elsewhere, as in the UFC. But that's it. Oh, but no no other local organisations there. I, I don't really want to fight on any any of the shows. If I'm like if Bam Bama were as I said were good enough to offer me um you know uh like a five fight contract to keep me really busy and then they were they were good enough to give me this other call so I'm quite happy to give them all my attention. Yeah, sure. I mean, what sort of turnaround would you like after the fight, or or does that depend on how the fight goes? Yeah, uh, well, they actually told me that they have a contract for me for right after this fight for my next fight, which will be in April. So uh, that, that, this is how I fight now. Would that that is that the next Bama, nineteen. Nine nineteen, I think in April, yeah. In Blackpool. That's what they've said. In Blackpool, yeah. I think so. I, I haven't even looked at it yet, man. I'll concentrate on what's going on here. Yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah sure. they they told me they'll have it there for me. So that that's how busy they're keeping. That's what I mean. That this is great. This is exactly what I want. You know. Exactly. I, I just want to be fighting regularly. Yeah. So yeah, as you say, you got that Zuffer clause. So. You know, with a bit, yeah. with a bit of luck, you'll get on that. If there's an, the next UFC card in Dublin, you know, you you're, you're looking at that really. Do you, do you see this? They're talking about Crow Park a lot. Do you, do you see that happening? Do you see that being realistic? I mean, that's a huge stadium. Um, yeah. They're saying. I think I think everyone's a little bit crazy about all that. No, I don't, I don't see it happening. If I'm being completely honest, I think uh, one, it's they, there's no cover for Crow Park. Now I'm sure you know Ireland. But, yeah. and it's it's the, probably the least reliable weather on the planet <laughs> so uh <laughs> we've no cover um the stadium something like it'll like if you set people on the pitch it'd be eighty thousand people probably um 
and uh, I've been there to watch a lot of uh, GAA, which is a national sport of Ireland. I'm sure you know, yeah, uh, American I mean. guys. No, um, but uh, it, it's uh, and like if you're sitting right at the back, you're not going to be able to see anything. I I just can't see it. I I think everyone's in the bubble that talks about it, so they think the sport's way bigger than it is. If you get me, you yeah. know. I know what I you just mean. Can't see Did you see the Frotch Frotch Groves two fight? Yes. I mean that was that was the biggest fight in I believe in British boxing history at Wembley Stadium. That that didn't have a Wembley doesn't have a cover either. Um, yeah. Obviously, and I think it did rain as well. And I don't, I don't know how they, they, they must, they just had a canopy over the ring. That you could do that surely for uh, the octagon as well. Yeah, but if you're sitting on the pitch, then you're the pain of fortune to sit close to the ring, and then you're not covered, and you're soaked. Yeah, true, true, true. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what so happened. You're sitting there. You, you can obviously afford champagne, but it'll be like an endless glass. It'll just keep filling up while you're sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. So, so you but, think... Uh, yeah, uh, I, I don't know, to be honest. Uh, like, I, I, I probably don't see Conor fighting in Ireland again. Really? You know, I think they're going to keep Conor for the big shows in, in America. I just... You know, like what they like, one hundred percent, they cannot fight in Krug Park after half ten, eleven o'clock at night. That's it. Like that's the last time you can have anything on there. Even if it's a gig, it has to finish at half ten. Right. So, so to get the pay per views in America, it would have to be on at three a.m. in Ireland. You know, people don't talk about this stuff. They just say, "Oh no, we could definitely do it." You know, but this is the this is the reality of it. The chances of getting like you can't put it on at 3 a.m. It just won't happen. They tried to put Garth Brooks concerts on during, like at normal times, but because there was four in a row, the people that lived around the stadium blocked it, and it didn't happen. Mm. Oh yeah, I mean, I was at I was at UFC Dublin at the O2 last time, and it is a sm it is notably a smaller arena. Um, I spoke to Norman Park after, and, and he 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 liked the idea of of maybe having it in the Odyssey Arena in Belfast. I'd say Norman did like that. <laughs> yeah, Norman would like that, yeah. But it's a bigger <laughs> arena than the O2 in Dublin is a point I'm making. Do you think that could work and still get the same sort of feel from it for being that... I know it's a Northern Irish arena, but... Yeah, get... I don't know if it would have the same... Like the, I, I've, been to, um, I've been to the Odyssey for a show, I think. It was the Forrest Griffin, uh, Rich Franklin against... Do um, you remember that one? It was on Northern Ireland. I think it was Rich Franklin against Okami, maybe. It may have been. Um, that was the Odyssey. Uh, I went to that show. I'm pretty sure that was the fight. Um, uh, Ting was on it as well. Forrest Griffin was on the fight card. It was a pretty decent card. It was before the UFC 93, the one in Dublin. Yeah. The first time they came. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, yeah, I just don't think it would have the same environment that you get in Dublin. There's just, Irish fans are crazy, dude. Yeah, it was they're, uh, they're it was Rich Franklin Akami, yeah, you're right. And Forrest Griffin yeah. like, did Hector Ramirez, yeah. But it, no, was a good, it was a good show, I was up at it, but it wasn't the same feel. No. Was you was you was you up in the nosebleeds for that one? Probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would say no, actually it was bought, the tickets were bought as a gift, so they weren't terrible, but they weren't great. Like, I was I definitely wasn't backstage or ringside anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Things have changed drastically. <laughs> they, changed have, drastically. they have. <laughs> will you be? Will you be going to? Will you be going to Vegas for uh, for the big fight for Connor's for Connor's title fight? I'll have to see what the story is because I'm as I said I'm trying to keep myself fairly busy and then if John has to go over with Connor for uh, like they'll probably go over for a few weeks beforehand. I might have to hold the fort down here unless calls on the card and then I'll have to go over with him. You know, so uh, I'll kind of figure it out by all that kind of stuff, but. Uh, like if John's going to be heading over there, I'll, I'll probably be, um, and if Cole's not in the card, I'll probably be staying home and kind of look at, looking after the team and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, sure. So who's who's normally in the corner with, with Connor when he gets four? Uh, it's Artem uh, Loboff. Do you know Artem? Yeah. Um, Owen Roddy, who's like an Irish MMA legend, and John. Right. So he has three, yeah? He has three, and then sometimes he'd have like Tom Egan if he's in like in Boston. He's had Tom Egan for the two times he's been there. Who was the first guy to ever find UFC from uh, the Republic? Yeah, yeah, that was the uh, the notorious uh, photo with Chuck Liddell that Connor went to that fight at, wasn't it? The uh... yeah, yeah. 
Well, There's a better photo actually where him and Pat Barry are playing slaps where they're slapping each other's stomachs. I haven't seen that one. <laughs> that that's pretty good. Like, I and mean, Connor obviously isn't winning because Pat Barry's a monster, so Connor's stomach is raw. Like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah. Well, Chris, thanks very much for your time. I mean, can can we get a, a Connor star prediction for your fight in a couple of weeks? I'm, I I personally will be there uh, live. I, I will hopefully be interviewing you after you win. Um, yep. Can, uh, can we get a prediction, Chris? How's it going to end? Um, how's it going to end? Well, uh, drink, uh, blood, blood will run and drink will flow. That that's probably what's going to happen. But it'll, I, I think, I think, I, I honestly think I'll finish him in the first round. Like, and and no, no, trying to blow smoke up his ass or sound tough. And I honestly, firmly believe I'll finish him in the first round. So anyone with a first round bet slip gets free entry to the after party, right? Anyone that approaches me afterwards with a first round bet slip will be bought a drink by me. Well, there you have it. They, I, I, listen to that, get your first round bets on it and find Chris after the fight. <laughs> all right, man. Chris, thank you very much for your time, mate. No stress at all. Have a good one, guys. Thanks, Chris. No problem at all. See you later. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye-bye. All right, so that was Chris Fields of Bama. Uh, as we mentioned, he has a, a fight coming up at Bama 18. Uh, what was the date on that again, Jim? It's the 21st. It's, uh, it's a Saturday, the 21st of February at Wolverhampton Civic Hall. If you're local, go down. The tickets are reasonably priced. It'll be a great show. There's some great fights uh, on that card. Uh, Chris Meir as well, who's a personal friend of mine I know from way back at school. He's fighting on that card. He's a really exciting prospect in the flyweight division. He's been training at Team Alpha Male. Uh, so he's a, that's really looking forward to seeing how he gets on. It's a, it's a great card. It, if, if you can't get down and watch it, I believe you can uh, I believe you can watch it through the Bama Facebook page. Uh, don't believe they have TV, right? So I'll double check that now, Nick. And uh, and as Jim mentioned, he's going to be there live, so uh, so I'm sure he'll be nice enough to be tweeting from the uh, either his personal account or the MMA Mad Twitter. Yeah, account. we will be. Well, what what we plan to do for this event is uh, I'll be doing some backstage uh, audio interviews, hopefully with the winning fighters, and I'll get that across to Dale, and we'll write up an article and get it on the site for you guys. Uh, but you know, it should be good. Listen, I've I've always supported Bama since. Uh, my first Bama event was Bama 4, uh, which was Tom Watson versus Alex Reed, which to this day, Mark Goddard, UFC referee Mark Goddard, still says is one of the best fights he's ever seen, and I agree. And this is this is Mark Goddard who's refed, um let me, let me just tell you, Mark Goddard says this is one of the best fights he's ever seen, and he's refereed Condit versus Hendricks, he's refereed um, uh, Wanderlei Silva versus Brian Stan. Uh, he's refereed the best, some of the best fights going, and he says, still says this: Alex Reed versus Tom Watson was one of the best he's ever seen. So, I've been with Bama, uh, I've been supporting Bama for a long time. They've made a change. They used to do these big arena shows. They've, they've had a move where they're doing smaller places, probably better for them. It means they'll survive financially, probably. Um, so yeah, support Bama when you can, as I say, and uh, we we will be there. And uh, we'll be putting the content out there for you guys, and you know, certainly letting you know how Chris gets on because some of you could be winning a bit of money. First round finish, remember that. <laughs> and it's it's one of their uh, kind of marquee guys on the card. You know, he had the the exposure of the Ultimate Fighter, and and he's he's from SPG Ireland, as we talked about. And as anyone listening to this obviously knows, uh, that's really become one of the the most prominent camps in MMA. So it seems like they're really trying to feature him as one of the big stars uh, of the Bama roster. Uh, as you said, five fights in a 12-year period, and they already have his next contract ready. So, so it's a good sign for him. Uh, I'm happy for him. Chris, actually, I forget when this interview was, either a year and a half or two two years ago. He was actually the first uh, first fighter that I ever interviewed. Uh, so that's it's a personal little milestone for me. Uh, I uh, talked to him, him and John Kavanaugh. They were nice enough to talk to me, but you know, a lot has changed since then. They've become a lot bigger uh, stars. The the the, the uh, promotion, I mean, the uh, camp itself has become somewhat of a household name. So uh, it, it's exciting to see him grow, and I'm happy that he's uh, he's kind of being one of the featured guys on on this promotion. So good for Chris. Absolutely, and a lovely guy. I wish him. I generally wish him all the best. He's, it's one of these fighters that you generally feel 
like you, oh, you really, really want to see do well because you like them as a person. I'm trying to think of some more examples in the UFC. Um, I'm sure you've got a few, Nick. Like, you know. Well, even if you're talking about like the even like the the bigger guys, like I don't think a lot of people root against someone like Uriah Faber. Exactly. Or, uh, yeah. There's always guys like this that you know, as journalists, we're not supposed to be biased, and and, and I'm not biased when I'm covering the sport, but at the same time, like a guy like Uriah Faber, who's proven throughout 15 years that you know he's. He's a really nice guy, and he's he's just trying to put on a good show for the fans, and he's always personable. Like obviously, part of you wants that guy to not necessarily beat another specific fighter, but you want him to be successful yeah, in his think, career listen, because he's earned it. Yeah, I don't think you can. You, you gotta. You, you can. Yeah, I know what you're saying, and about not being biased, but I still think you've got to. Um, you know, you've got to. You've got to have. Uh, you got. You got to be real in this game. There's no point in being fake, and I'm. I'm. To, you know. I, I'm very open about what I feel and I say what I think as well and, and I just get their feeling from Chris and I really do, I do hope he does well, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I hope he can get on that Dublin card, which he thinks Conor McGregor won't headline. Yeah, it's true. It's interesting because you, uh, you look at guys like, like GSP and I'd have to look it up. Uh, I mean, I might as well have the computer right in front of me, so I'll look it up while I'm talking, but uh, you look at guys like GSP and obviously he's kind of the uh, the big name from, from Canada. He has a lot of Canadian fans. He's huge over there. Huge everywhere, but huge over there. And uh, once you become champion, you kind of lose that... Uh, once you become big enough, they're putting most of your cards in Vegas, it looks like. Oh, it looks like I just am completely wrong with that. I'm looking at it now. I guess he fights in Canada all the time. So, who's, ignore what I just who's said. It seems like a lot of times when people become champions and, and they're kind of big names, they, they put them on these Vegas cards. Who, John Jones? That. John Jones, yeah, yeah, but then he's from uh, New York, so you can't really put him yeah. in his hometown. But uh, yeah, because but you can put him in Jersey or something. Yeah, he's fought in Canada quite a bit because he the fight against Cormier was his first fight back in Vegas since he fought Bader. Because uh, that's what he was saying when he on the UFC embedded episode, he was like in the car, and um, he goes, uh, "This is the, they said the last time I was in Vegas, I fought I beat a wrestler." So. You know that was uh you know it was pretty pretty good for the lead up to be fair uh and he did you know he he, he uh, performed very well against Cormier. Yeah, it's interesting that Chris Fields mentioned the uh, that his contract does include that Zufa contract or that exactly, uh, Zufa yeah. clause, so that the UFC yeah, does come calling, he he has every right to uh, to join back up with the UFC roster. So definitely yeah, a good, good bit of negotiation from him. It's good that these organisations are putting clauses like this in because ultimately, you know, the UFC. You know they are the they are the uh, the big player and they are where people want to get. Um, so it's good that they're, they're they're letting people leave when the opportunity comes up. Yeah, of course. I mean, Bama and, and play, uh, promotions like Bama, they, they obviously know that they're not a direct competitor with the UFC. They uh, you know nowhere, they have nowhere near the same uh, like mainstream appeal and whatever. It's obviously the UFC is on, on its own level. Sure. There are competitors. There. I would consider Bellator and, and World Series of Fighting. Yeah, uh, but I don't I'm not winning, but I consider them competitors. But regional organizations like Bama must know that uh, UFC contract is is uh, definitely trumps the contract with their uh, promotion. But, but I like I like the uh, the freedom that uh, Bellator are giving Paul Daly, whereas they're letting him fight for K1 kickboxing, they're letting him potentially have a boxing match, they're letting him fight Muay Thai in Thailand, they're letting him yeah I've said the boxing yeah. You know, that, and that's surprising from Bellator's uh, point of view that they would do that. Yeah, well, uh, Joe Schilling also fights for Bellator, and, and he uh, obviously it's on, it's on the same network, but uh, they, they, he has a last product for Glory Kickboxing. And then also, I heard uh, a story came out, I believe it was last week, saying that he, he's actually interested in doing boxing too. Uh, I guess Spike TV over here in the United States. They, they broadcast Bellator and Glory, and I guess they're going to start broadcasting uh, regular boxing matches as well. And he wants to become the network's first uh, three-sport athlete, which would be kind of cool. But, yeah, it seems like Bellator is willing to share, and I don't know if that's a, a product of the new uh, upper management there with, with Scott Coker and, and his team. But, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely interesting and definitely good for fight fans. Well, it might be a tactic of Scott Coker, you know, uh, a way of making, uh, making it so fighters are happy with the organization. Do you know what I mean? Like... So you know they might they that they we pay well and also you can actually go and earn money elsewhere as well and you know there's so many fighters bitching about pay and, and not having the freedom to do other things that, that I think that's the way they're trying to appeal to some of these fighters and take them from the UFC. 
Yeah, that's definitely smart. Um, but yeah, so so this Saturday there's a there's a UFC event. Nothing this past weekend, uh, but but this Saturday there's a UFC event. Not the most exciting card. It's uh it's you know it's a fight night card, so you're gonna see a little drop off and in, uh, in, in appeal, but. Um, it, it's headlined by Benson Henderson and Brandon Thatch. Kind of a strange matchup. Thatch is uh, is ranked significantly below Henderson, I think. Do you know is he ranked at all? Thatch. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't believe he is. Right, and uh, you know Benson Henderson has kind of been a guy who's always said I'll fight anyone anywhere, and it seems like he, he's backing that up uh, well, he's perfectly not, with this. Actually, he's not ranked below Benson Henderson because Benson Henderson's not ranked at welterweight. This is his first fight at welterweight in the UFC. Um, it's going to be interesting. I think, you know, Ben saved the card. He was saying he'd fight anyone. You know, I think it'd be interesting to see how he gets on against a killer that he's Brandon Thatch and somebody who's got a lot of hype behind him. Right, and, and Thatch... Uh... I believe this this will be his third UFC fight, so he, he's still relatively new to the promotion. But I, I believe he only has one loss. Um, really, really dangerous guy. Lots of finishes. I, I think both of his UFC fights ended in the first round. Yeah, see, so his debut is against Justin Edwards. Finished him uh, via TKO in just a minute, just under a minute and a half. Uh, got knocked out of the night, and then he followed it up against uh, Paulo Tiago, very dangerous opponent. And uh, it was ruled as a submission, but it was actually a, a knee to the body that dropped him. Also in the first round, also uh, it was a little bit over two minutes, but that was in Brazil as well. So that's that's always impressive to finish a Brazilian in Brazil, and uh, and yeah, that Bash is definitely he's got all the makings. He hasn't lost since 2008. He's 11 and one, um, two and zero in the UFC. So it's obviously a huge step up for him. Definitely the biggest name uh, he's fought. It's, you know, Benson Henderson was former uh, UFC lightweight champion. He was champion for a long time. Um, It'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see if he can step up and defeat a guy like Bendo because if he can, that 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 almost I don't know if it thrusts him in the title picture yet, but with that record and, and a win like Bendo, uh, who's always dangerous, always uh, uh, he's, I mean he's beaten everyone in that lightweight division. Granted, it's a new division, but uh, yeah, I think he'll be right up there in the in the discussion, uh, maybe like one or two fights away from uh, being considered for a welterweight title shot. Who's Thatch or uh, Henderson? Uh, Thatcher, I think I think if Henderson um, wins, he has, uh, I don't know. I'd say both. He's got to go back down to one fifty-five. I don't you think, think that. So, right? uh, yeah, I don't think he'll carry on at one seventy, even if he does get the win. I mean, he's been um, he's proven that he's first of all he never has trouble cutting the weight to one fifty-five, and he's also uh, I mean he's uh, about as dominant as you can be. He was, he was champion for a long time. Really, you know, he he just lost to uh, Cerrone, but it was a, a razor close fight. And uh, otherwise, it seems like Anthony Pettis, the, the current champion, he's the only guy that really has his number. Besides that, Benson Henderson has really proven that you know he's he's probably the, one of the best, if not the best, 155er out there. So I don't see any reason for him to make a permanent weight class change. I yeah, agree. I agree. Um, but yeah, the only of the there's a few other fights that interest me. Uh, Holloway's on a tear. He's fighting Cole Miller in the co-main event. That's a pretty weak co-main event, isn't it? Really, when you look at it. Um, yeah, I mean, it was supposed to be headlined by Matt Brown and Tarek Safadeen. That fight got pulled because of injuries. Uh, and obviously, Stephen Thompson versus Thatch with a co-main, I believe. Yeah, it was. And then Thompson got injured, so that so he got pulled. And then replaced by Benson, promoted to the main. Yeah, it's a, you know, it's an alright card. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously a downgrade when, when you deal with those injuries, but I think some good has come out of it. Uh, for example, uh, no offense to Tarek Safney, I think he's an extremely, uh, extremely exciting fighter, but you know, now we have Matt Brown versus Johnny Hendricks coming up, and that's that fight's clearly it's just on an all-other level. So that's, that's an exciting uh, sort of accidental outcome from the injury, so that's good. And then, uh, and yeah, obviously it's a downgrade because that, you know, the basically the guy who's in the main event now, he, he should have been in the co-main event. So obviously you're going to see a little drop-off there, but... Um, I do think the Conan event is an exciting matchup, at least stylistically. Max Holloway, as you mentioned, he, he's been on a tear. Um, he, he's four and zero since losing to Conor McGregor in Boston, and and you know Conor McGregor tore his ACL in the second round. But when you see how uh, how Conor McGregor just kind of run through guys, even Poirier got knocked out in just a matter of minutes. Um, it, it really shows how talented Holloway was. I think at the time he uh, he's kind of a no name. Um, 
actually been in the UFC for a long time, but you know, he, he just wasn't one of these marquee names. And, and when he was fighting McGregor, people really didn't know uh, how good he was. Young guy, he's only 23 now, obviously younger than time. Um, but if you notice too, McGregor in, in some of the, the lead up and the recap of the fight, uh, he was actually fairly complimentary towards Holloway, which you know he's kind of known for his sound bites and his trash talking. So you don't hear that too often. But McGregor basically was complimenting Holloway on, on being a really talented prospect, and uh, and, yeah. and now we're starting to see it. We we saw that he's gone four and since then. So I can really see that being you know there's a few things I can see happening in the division. One of them is Max Holloway keep carries this tear on, and then starts getting promoted as this the only guy to take Conor McGregor to a decision in the UFC. And that's the way they promote that fight again. Um, I know he had an injury, but I just feel they're going to promote it that way. <clears throat> um, and the other thing I can see happening is Joseph Duffy coming into the UFC, which he has been signed. Obviously, Joseph Duffy, the last guy to beat Conor McGregor. Uh, and he's Joseph Duffy is fucking good as well. If you uh, if you watch his recent fights in Cage Warriors, you know he's, he's legit. And I think he'll come into the UFC and have a have a couple good wins, and they'll start hyping that fight up as well. And I think you know, listen, I don't kind of acts like he's done in the featherweight division after he wins the belt. I don't think he is at all. I think he's got a lot of fights still to do. Well, I think that's the thing too. Is you know, uh, just Duffy's at lightweight. Connor's... Sorry, Duffy's at lightweight, so that one will be when he moves up. Okay, but uh, just because of Connor's, um, you know, his his microphone skills and kind of hyping up fights. Uh, he whatever fights he, he's in, it's gonna make uh, both guys a lot of money. It's just that he's gonna have that sort of appeal. It's gonna be a big, a big marquee fight, especially if he becomes champion. So basically, you have all these guys in the featherweight division that are gonna be lining up to fight McGregor, and and, and it becomes a question of who actually gets that chance. And I think you're right. You're gonna need the, those uh, special storylines. You're gonna need a guy like Holloway who took him all the way to to three rounds and hasn't hasn't lost since. Uh, you're gonna need a guy, as you mentioned, he's uh, he's in the weight class up. But you're gonna you're gonna need someone who, who beat him in cage wars. You're gonna need these uh, these extra little storylines to help help sell a fight because every single person in the division is gonna want that fight, um, even more than just a regular champion because they know that at the end of the day there's a huge paycheck on the line, a lot of exposure, um, all all these different extra elements that you don't necessarily get with with other matchups. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you know. I just, I think when he wins that belt, I just think there's going to be, seriously, when I was in Thailand, there were so many people who d didn't really watch MMA or the UFC at all, but knew who Conor McGregor was and was watching this fight because Conor McGregor was on it, and it was surreal to see, to be honest with you. Well, yeah, I think the guys realize too. I think the the people in the division, even the people who have kind of made it clear that that they're not the biggest fan of McGregor, they realize what he's doing for this division and what he's doing for the sport, and and, and ultimately it's good for everybody. Just having someone who's bringing this many eyes to the sport. Uh, you know, I, I interviewed Jim uh, Ehlers earlier this week, and he uh, he's fighting this card too. He's on the prelims fighting Chas Yeah, Skelly. friend friend of the show, Jim Ehlers. Yeah, he was uh, he's a uh, earlier podcast guest. Really nice guy. Uh, also a Cage Warriors guy, so he has some experience with McGregor uh, before McGregor started uh, making his, his sort of UFC journey. But, um, but yeah, Jim Ehlers uh, has made it pretty clear that he, he's not a fan of McGregor. He doesn't, he doesn't like the guy personally, but I asked him about him. I said, take your personal feelings out of it. Uh, how, how do you feel about McGregor? And he said basically um, that, you know, he's, obviously he's, he's good at hyping fights. He, he's, uh, he's a good fighter. He's, he's bringing a lot of attention to the, to the division and the sport, and he appreciates that. And then, I, and then I said, uh, "Go ahead and let those personal feelings fly." And he uh, he did a, a bit of name calling. I, I kept it clean in the post that I wrote. I didn't want to come on, Nick. Uh, reveal it now. Reveal. Uh, it. It's, let's say it's a four-letter word that uh, that starts with a C. Really? Yeah. He said it very clearly. He's like, I said, no, uh, I'm let those personal I'm feelings fly. So Jim Allen's called Conor McGregor a cunt, basically. Yes, one hundred. Yes, and that's it wow. too. That was the full answer. I sent him a, uh, <laughs> I could have used that to hype it too. I could, I could have included that in a tweet. I was trying to keep it family friendly. Uh, probably <laughs> no, would have got us a lot more so, traffic. But yeah, that would have that. I don't know what that would have done to MMA math. Just put in tagging Jim Allers, Conor McGregor is a cunt. Nothing else <laughs> but that. <laughs> That's exactly. I, I sent him. Uh, we did the interview over emails, and I sent him. Uh, I sent him some questions, and I sent him. You know, I said, take your personal feelings out. How do you feel about Conor McGregor and what he's done for the division? And he's very. You know, like I said, he said. Uh, he said Conor McGregor, uh, you know, he's bringing a lot of eyes to the sport. He's good at having fights, whatever. And then when I said let those personal feelings fly, his full answer was, uh, he is a cunt. 
<laughs> so, uh, That's so fine. clearly That's not, uh, not, not, not uh, too timid. And this is obviously in the interview. It wasn't like this was a candid conversation. So uh, I had yeah, no I mean, problem with me uh, printing that information if I chose to. So. <laughs> and obviously now we've, we've shown that the MMA Mad podcast is, uh, is not suitable for uh, people uh, under the age of, I don't know, what is the legal to legal uh, being able to hear swear words age I don't think there really is one is there uh, I don't know uh, we'll definitely have a little warning at the beginning of the podcast uh, <laughs> a little uh, you know maybe vulgar language in the warning podcast. Nick Risner says cunt that should be uh, that should be the the, uh, the title theory. of that <laughs> yeah it should be called episode 13 Chris Fields and Nick Risner says cunt <laughs> and, yeah, Sam, I don't know if we'd get pulled from iTunes for that. I don't know. Or maybe they put the little uh, explicit neck thing next to the uh, next to the title <laughs> yeah. of this episode. But, no. Yeah. So uh, so yeah, Jim Miller's is not, not one to uh, to sugarcoat what he's saying. So you know, it's it's, it's I was I, I laughed when I read it, and then I had to go through this whole process of like, uh, do I do I type that word in the post? Is it gonna <laughs> I don't know. So I try to be subtle about it, and then uh, and then Jim actually sh- shared the post on his uh, Facebook. And I saw a couple of people in his like comment section ask like like enlighten us what was the four letter word so uh, so I don't know if you messaged them or not but it's official it's in this podcast so maybe we can tease it by saying you can find out what uh, what he actually called McGregor in this episode <laughs> but yeah he's uh, yeah Jim Miller's a real nice guy yeah he is yeah us. and then uh, another one uh, Kevin Lee who I, I don't believe I interviewed him him for MMA Mad but I used to have a website before this just a kind of solo one that I did by myself and. He was the first uh, UFC fighter that I ever interviewed. So, also really nice guys from Detroit. He's on the the main card in this in this uh, fight night. He's fighting uh, Michael we know, Prezeres. We know, we know you love Kevin Lee, Nick. He's a nice guy. I haven't, I haven't talked to him in a long time, but uh, just, <laughs> he's my first UFC fighter that I ever interviewed. So you know, you're that's... totally okay with being biased to Kevin Lee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he's, <laughs> I, I actually didn't realize. I looked up his record recently, and he. Uh, he has a lot more wins than I thought. I know he lost his UFC debut because I interviewed him. Uh, I interviewed him prior to his UFC debut, and it was like right after he got signed. I saw the announcement. I, I think I saw it out on Twitter. Uh, this, this is I don't know. Let's see. Uh, February first, two thousand fourteen. So um, you know, it was it was over uh, a year ago when I interviewed him. That was his UFC debut. But uh, he fought Ally Aquinta, and you know, we yeah, just saw what Ally Aquinta did to. Uh, to Always dangerous, Joe Lowe is on. So. Yeah. No shame in losing to him. Really tough UFC debut. Uh, but he lost to Ally Quinta and he's actually won two since then. Uh, Jesse Ronson and, and John Tuck. So uh, so it seems like he's hitting his stride. Uh, all decisions so far. But, but you know, I know at least prior to the UFC, he was a, a big submission guy. I'm looking now. Uh, he was 7-0 and before entering the UFC. And, and out of those seven uh, wins, six of those were submissions. So... Big finisher hasn't really amounted, uh, hasn't really lived up to that reputation in the UFC. But obviously, as he become more comfortable, I'm sure he'll be looking for uh, finishes in this. But yeah, he's uh, he's he's young too, I believe, and, and you know he's yeah he's only 22 years old right now, so that's pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, he, he, yeah he, we'll see how he does. Uh, to be fair, I don't know much about Michael uh, Prezeres, but uh, you know you never you gotta take your opportunities, and then ultimately, no matter who you're facing. Um, once you get enough wins in a row, it becomes about the win streak itself and not so much about the, the specific matchup. So hopefully he can keep on this win streak. He's got two, and uh, and best of luck to him, obviously, uh, as well as Michael Prezeres. But, um, but, yeah, we'll see. And, and that's just a personal fight for me. Yeah. Honestly, I don't see how that would have much mainstream appeal, both kind of uh, uh, not really big names. Uh, it's definitely a weak card, to be fair. Uh, yes. Nick Lentz is another guy who's... who's uh, I believe he's, he's still ranked in the top 15, or mm. he might be top 10, actually, at featherweight. Um, he's on the prelims, headline on the prelims. That's an okay fight. Uh, Neil Magny is always exciting. He was on a, a huge win streak. Did he lose yet, or is he still on that win streak? No, he's still on that, he's still on that win streak. He, he won, uh, I believe, four times in 2014. Uh, five times in 2014. Five times, wow. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, a little note uh, here. It says tied UFC record for most wins in the calendar year. So yeah, uh, yeah, unbelievable win streak for him. He's, he's always exciting to watch too. Um, he, he's on the main card, but outside of some some random uh, appeals here and there, not even matchups either. Usually, uh, at least for me, a lot of these are just I'm excited to see a specific guy fight as opposed to the fight itself. But, uh, but yes, it's a weak card. But you know they can't all be great. We've had a, a pretty good start to the year, so yeah. So uh, that, that's the UFC final: Henderson versus Thatch. 
uh, from Broomfield, Colorado, February 14th. Tune in to that. But I think before we go, we should touch on probably one of the biggest hitting stories in the MMA media recently. Absolutely. Uh, uh, personally for me one of the biggest disappointments not in Nick Diaz because that could have been predicted <laughs> but uh, Anderson Silva is, it appears he's on the juice he's on the roids he tested positive for two types of steroids uh, after his fight with Nick and it's just put a downer on I think he's put a downer on his career, I'm being honest. I know you shouldn't say that because he, he's never tested positive before. But it has. Because I don't believe they always did um, pre-fight testing, did they? Um, yeah, I don't believe... Because this is, this is a month before the actual fight, right? When they when they tested positive? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so I don't know. Maybe, you know, you don't want to say this, but at the same time, if that's true, if they, if they don't do pre-fight testing, then... It at least it it adds a cloud of uh, a cloud of doubt. Uh, you know, has he been doing this his whole career, or is this the first time he's ever done it? Uh, if they haven't been testing during this time before, even if he's never done it before, it's the type of thing where now people have to question other fights that he's had in his career. So definitely unfortunate. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think you know Nick testing positive for marijuana was you know you it was fifty fifty really to be honest. I mean, anyone anyone could have you know. I don't even think the UFC have bothered releasing a statement on that, have they? I don't. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't. I didn't see anything, but also, yeah, like you said, it's pretty expected. Yeah, and, I think there's yeah. mixed views on that. Anyway, my personal opinion is, uh, you know, it's a banned substance, but I think it's, you know, it's not necessarily a performing, performance enhancing substance. Uh, presumably, he wasn't stoned during the fight, so I don't think it was. You know, the effects of that drug have, you know, worn off. So. I don't think there's uh, any sort of performance enhancing uh, to it, so yeah, I don't know. I've no real issues with that, but the the steroid thing, yeah, of uh, GSP is pound for pound for me now. Yeah, and I, I uh, you know, I used to uh, debate this with people, and for the most part, uh, people didn't take me very seriously. But I, I thought resume alone, GSP was already uh, at least yeah. in the like people people put in the discussion anyway. Yeah. But I think you can make a solid. Uh, a solid case that GSP's resume is stronger than yeah. He's and the, 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 the yeah, standard the of fighters he's fought, absolutely yeah. And right, know, and you look at the, the, some of the the big trilogy fights he had and stuff, and just everything. I, I just feel like uh, this just caps it off. This just caps it off. Right. Yep. Exactly. Because Anderson Silva was, was always flashier. Uh, you know, he has he has the highlight reels and stuff. But for me, I always thought GSP had the edge, and I think that John Jones will pass them all if he keeps on this this winning streak. Yeah, for um, sure. He's already he's already in the discussion if he's any if he ended his career right now, to be honest. And he's still a young guy. Uh, Absolutely. He still has lots of uh, great fights in the future and a heck of a start for his career, undefeated because I don't count that. John Jones will surpass George. Sadly, it's sad because I love George, but he will. John Jones on an absolute tear. Like you said, if he retired now at the age of twenty six, I think. He would be considered, and you know, look at the people he's bought. Yeah, uh, he's beaten. He's only he's only got a few more to go, and he's and he's potentially pound for pound. You know, you can't argue that. Right, one hundred percent. And obviously, you know, GSP's retired at least for the time being, and and John Jones uh, or uh, Anderson Silva's career is coming to an end, coming off uh, uh, two losses, and now this failed drug test, uh, and and Jones still being a young man. He he has the the time and the and the. Uh, the chance to, to pass everyone, but um, so so Jones failed a drug test of his own. What was the deal with that? I did watch the interview. I know it was for cocaine, but what was the interview like? What did John say about failing a drug test for cocaine? Um, I believe I can't remember. I watched it a while ago, but I think the general thing was, you know, I'm not a cocaine addict. I know that was not the highlight, the promo for that interview. Um, I think it was it, what he was saying was you know I made a mistake a dumb mistake it was like a one time thing he, he doesn't uh, use cocaine regularly and uh, it was a mistake and you know I obviously that we I mean not obviously if you haven't read it into the details but uh, apparently during the drug test they're not supposed to test for cocaine so obviously it's not an excuse it's still a banned substance and he should have uh, he should have avoided uh, using it but at the same time um, you know he he. If he like, even if he thoroughly read the drug test policy, he wouldn't have expected to actually get in trouble for that. So yeah, um, I don't think that. I mean, obviously, I don't know the guy. I'm not like with him every day, but it seems like it probably was a one-time thing that he did. Like, 
a party or social gathering or something. I don't think that he's a regular user or, or an addict by any means. And yeah, I think, I, think that, it, I think it only bothers me really that, you know, I'm, I'm very much a believer in people should live their lives the way they want to, but the fact that he is in, uh, people look up to him, children potentially look up to him, I think it was... Yeah, the role model effect. Exactly, yeah. That was the only sort of bad thing about it like, for me, you know what I mean? Uh, because, you know, he is a young guy and he does, you know, he's make, he's just making mistakes as he is, but I, th- I don't think he's at, there's actually room for those type of mistakes in the position he's in. Right, right, and then, uh, and yeah, there's, there's definitely the role model effect, that's one of the disappointing parts, and then, um, I don't know, it, it sucks, because I feel like it's constantly, it's just been, you know, I don't know if it's a result of UFC having a stricter drug policy, or, or what the actual reason is, but it seems like, uh, it seems like there's been this, this kind of back-to-back people failing these drug tests, and it, it I definitely uh, cast a shadow on the sport in general, and it's disappointing for fans, because, you know, you're kind of holding your breath after it's, uh, a big fight happens, you know, like, it, it, we're gonna wait and like find out that someone was on on uh, drugs or someone uh, takes steroids. Or, you know, like what's what's the situation? So so when you see a really good fight, all of a sudden now you have the skepticism in your head, and and that's just an unfortunate uh, reality. Yeah, oh, you know I agree. Um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm good about silver. Um, what what's his defense? I hear he's actually putting up a defense to it. Well, he said that. Uh, that he he's basically saying that he's never done cocaine or never done uh, test John Jones. He's saying that he's never uh, taken steroids in his life, and that the test is obviously false, and he's trying to appeal it. But um, I don't know. I, I mean, it's possible that's false, but I think a lot of people say that too. I, I don't know how big uh, Lance Armstrong is internationally. Is he? Is he you obviously. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay, and he. Uh, you know, for years he denied. I never did it. I never did it. And then finally, there's there's more or less definitive proof that he did it, and and it just makes it look way worse because now, uh, you cheated and and you're lying about it. So it just kind of complicates everything. So you know, if he didn't do it, that's one thing, and I'll, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt and see if they can win this appeal. But if he did, uh, I personally wish he would just own up to it because it doesn't make things better to to deny it if you're going to come out with the truth eventually anyway. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, I think that uh. That pretty much wraps it up for uh, for tonight. I think it was a good good way. Not much ring rust there. Uh, nah, I think it went pretty smoothly. Yeah, I think it was a good good first podcast back. You know, we are trying. I did say on a podcast before that we was gonna have Mike Swick on. That is not dead. Mike Swick is still. We're still in contact with him. We're trying to get him on. We should be doing an interview with Mike. You know, either this weekend or the weekend after, or even the weekend after, whenever it suits, really. Um, still a really interesting one. I really want to talk to Mike, and I'm sure you do, Nick. Yeah, he founded uh, AKA Thailand, correct? He did. I've got a lot of questions about that because he's the founder and owner. Uh, does Mike? You know, there's he's, in Thailand. I know quite a lot about about Thailand. You know, uh, and I know you can't own own land in Thailand as a foreigner. You have to you have to have a Thai business, two Thai business partners. So I assume he must have two Thai business partners. He, he, I, I don't know how he's done it, but yeah, he is the founder and owner of AKA Thailand, and it looks amazing to be honest with you. Yeah, so he'll, he'll be a really interesting guy to talk to. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, on the first season Ultimate Fighter, he's a legend in this game, and uh, and personally, I, I can't wait. I think that's it's always exciting. You know, I, I can't complain. Uh, this job, it's not even. It doesn't take a lot of work to be honest, because I'll talk about MMA all day. So I, I love talking about it. I love uh, writing articles about it. But you know, then like I have to wake up uh, early for this. I think if we're if we're trying to do it on Saturday, I will have to wake up uh, a little early to do it because you know he's in Thailand, Jim's in the UK. But I yeah, mean, what like I, a, I can't complain. What? There's like a I think it's like a 13 hour difference for you. Right. Yeah, but I can't complain about uh, about waking up early and. Uh, and talking about a UFC legend, so I, I'm definitely fortunate a, to have this opportunity and yeah. look forward. A real legend, you know. There's not. You know, oh, absolutely. He, he's amongst there with our biggest guests. Um, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, the things yeah, he's forward. been through in his life. You know, I'm sure he had. I'd have to research it again, but I'm I'm sure he had a real bad illness that he came back from and knocked out Demarcus Johnson after that. And you know, he, he's such an interesting dude, and I am looking forward to interviewing him. Right. Um, yeah, and then, so the, the UFC is uh, on Valentine's Day again, and uh, I believe Jim or, uh, or Dale will be covering it, because I have a Valentine's date. Oh, uh, Jim, Jim yes. and Dale do not, so, uh, so they're gonna, they'll, be, they'll be home on their, on their computers or their phones or uh, doing whatever. So. Dale said all my dates are in Thailand. Yeah, and uh, I believe uh, Dale also said that he has a date with Paige Van Zandt, but 
We haven't yeah. confirmed these rumors. Uh, <laughs> unlikely, I would say. <laughs> but yeah, good luck on your date, Nick. Oh, thank you. So uh, everyone, tweet Nick at Nick Risner MMA. Good luck on your date with the heart emoji. Oh, the heart emoji. It'd be a nice touch. I appreciate it. <laughs> But All yeah. right, well, uh, I think that wraps it up for this week. Uh, yeah, and we will have some music on this episode as well, thanks to... Oh, our yeah, we, uh, we've we been doing a, a little hiring uh, at MMA Mad. He, uh, Dale posted, uh, on, on our website, he posted a, a little thing about uh, looking for new writers, and we actually, I think we stumbled upon a uh, video editor as well, so... Yeah, Cam's uh, our editor. Cam's doing, you know, he, he's created a song for the podcast, so... You know, it's going well. He's, he's wicked at what he does. So, yeah, we've said it for uh, for this whole time. We're going to get a song. Nick never sorted it out. So, uh, you know. I believe there's a team effort. And, and a team effort. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, uh, it seems like after all this time, we, we'll finally have uh, a professional sounding podcast. So, this, this is yeah. good news uh, for you guys, good news for us. And uh, and uh, thanks to, to Cam for helping out. Yeah, for um, sure. And yeah, hopefully, I think I think the the post is still on the website. So if you're interested in writing for MMA Mad or working with us in some way, just uh, just seek out that post. I think it's probably two or three down at this point. And uh, and send us an email. We we'd love to uh, check out some writing samples, and we're always trying to expand and, and make this thing a big success. So. Absolutely, but yeah, thank you very much for uh, listening in, guys. Catch us when we're back. We will tweet it out. Uh, it will hopefully be with Swick. If not, it will be with someone else. Uh, but yeah, thanks for listening, guys. I've been Jim. Uh, I'm Nick, and uh, and we're uh, well, of course we're MMA Mad, and it's uh, Twitter.com/slash MMA Mad Official and Facebook.com/slash MMA Mad Official. And MMA Mad Official. Uh, check us out there. That's the, the easiest way to follow new posts and new uh, announcements. So we'd appreciate you checking out there. And then also subscribe on iTunes. We uh, this podcast is on uh, is on iTunes. You can either search the MMA Mad podcast or uh, if, if you're on our website, there'll be a link included in the post. And YouTube, subscribe, share, like. Thank you. Uh, enjoy, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, bye, guys.